We are currently in a Bible teaching series that has been a really interesting series. I hope that you have been blessed as a result of connecting to this Bible teaching series. The series is titled Revelation Revealed. It's been a great series and already in our Bible teaching series we have discovered so many valuable truths. When we open the Word of God and we begin to study the Word of God, we were reminded that we're studying the book of Revelation. Not the book of Revelations, but the book of Revelation. And people may ask, what is it a revelation of? Well, the Bible answers that question. The Bible says the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So that when we study the book of Revelation, it is the unfolding or the unveiling of the totality of Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We understood that the book of Revelation, or the word apocalypse means to uncover or to unveil or to reveal. We understood as we've taken our journey that the book of Revelation is written in chronological order. Chapter 1 is called the history and then chapter 2 and chapter 3 is called the ecclesiastical age or the age of grace, the grace age dispensation. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 and then chapter 4 all the way through chapter 22 we were we're reminded that that is what we call the prophetical future or the study of eschatology as we look at the prophecy of the future. Now this future begins in part with chapter 4, realizing that the church is raptured. I don't know about you guys, but I can't wait until we all are called up to meet the Lord in the air. Can I get an amen? One day the church is going to be raptured off planet earth and we realize that we're going to be going, are you listening to me, we're going to be raptured up to the third heaven. Now we understand that there is a first heaven and that first heaven is the clouds that we see and then there is the second heaven and the second heaven is where the sun and the moon and the planets are and then there is the third heaven and the Bible says that God resides in the third heaven and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven ever living to make intercession for us. And as we understood that we're raptured and we're taken to the third heaven. Then all of a sudden we find in the study of the book of Revelation that there is a sealed scroll. And that sealed scroll is what's known as Daniel's 70th week. When Daniel was given the prophecy of the 70th week, the Spirit of God said to Daniel, seal the 70th week. And Daniel sealed it. And the Bible tells us that that scroll was sealed until the book of Revelation. And all of heaven began to declare who is worthy to open the seven sealed scroll. And the Bible tells us that the proclamation was made known that Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, is the only one that was worthy to open the seven sealed scroll. And Jesus began to open the scrolls. We realize that the first four seals we were introduced to the writers of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and we studied that in our Bible study as we began to journey through. And then last Sunday we understood about the slain martyrs that were murdered after the fifth seal was opened. And then last Sunday we studied the sixth seal that was opened and you'll remember if you were here last Sunday the sixth seal designated the 144,000 evangelists that had the mark of God on their head and they were sealed of God 12,000 off the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel and they were sealed to be the evangelist of the tribulation period. And last Sunday we studied that and then we understood that we were opening the seventh seal. And when the seventh seal was beginning to be opened all of a sudden there was a silence in heaven for how long do you remember? 30 minutes. Complete silence in heaven. The silence in heaven was a sound that would penetrate the very core of who you are. All of heaven became extremely silent. Can you imagine the voices of the angelic choir, the incredible seraphim and cherubim that sings out, holy, 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 was hushed and made to be silent. All of heaven became silent and you could hear a pin drop and now we see the seventh seal that's about to be 
be open. When the seventh seal is open, we found the four woes that were displayed after the seven seals were open. The judgment of God is now falling upon this earth. God's grace is over. The time of judgment is at hand. The judgment of God and the wrath of God is being mightily displayed upon the earth as people have rejected grace and rejected Jesus Christ. And now judgment is going to fall upon the earth for seven years. We understood that there was a time called the tribulation period. And the tribulation period would last literally seven years. They would be broken up in two different compartments. First, there would be the first three and a half years that would be called the tribulation period. And then the last three and a half years would be called the great tribulation period. So we realize now that all of a sudden the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth. So today, as we take our Bible and open it up to the book of Revelation, let's look there at Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 13. Are you with me? Say amen. Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 13, we find that here, here we see the, third, the three last woes that are going to come up on the earth. And the title, as we look there together today, the title is simply this, Woe, Woe, Woe to the Inhabitants of the Earth. Would you say that with me? Woe, Woe, Woe to the Inhabitants of the Earth. I want you to circle those three woes in the title today. Those three words are words of grief and denunciation. It is a time where there is a woe that's being sounded, the triple woes that are given to the inhabitants of the earth. And when you look there together, it is a sound of grief, a sound of despair, a sound of agony. The, the angelic beings are beginning to scream out, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. The denunciation that is about to happen, the critical judgment that is about to fall, the wrath of God that is about to be revealed upon all those that are left on planet earth after the rapture takes place. And I want you to notice there in Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. When you look there together, now we see John, the beloved disciple, who is there on the Isle of Patmos, and God rolls back the curtain of the future for him to see. Don't miss it. Are you with me? Don't miss it at all. John says, I beheld and I heard. I beheld and I heard. When you think about John, that beloved disciple that is on the Isle of Patmos, and all of a sudden we see the faculties of his eyes and the faculties of his ears that is looking and beholding what's about to take place. And as John beholds that, he says, I saw an angel that's flying through heaven. Now don't miss this. Why did I tell you earlier about the three heavens? When you see this angel that's flying through heaven, this angel is flying through the second heaven. In other words, it's not the third heaven where the church is, but it is in the second heaven. The second heaven where this angel flies, and he has a perspective of all the corners of the globe. This angel is flying through the second heaven, and as he looks upon the, the totality of this earth, as he sees the earth in all the shape, and all the forms, and all the corners, and every picture that you could possibly look at around this earth as the angel flies through the second heaven. He looks down and gazes upon this earth and the only words that can come out of this angel's mouth is woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants that are living on this earth. Can you imagine that terrible time? That angel is screaming out, He's saying there is a distinct and manifested class of people spoken of. And notice in verse number 13, he says that there is a woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants, underline that in your Bible, of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth. It will be against this perverse and unbelieving group. These terrible woes of God will be directed to those inhabitants upon the earth. It will reach every square inch of the 
universe and will have to do with every person who inhabits the earth. Are you listening? Nobody escapes the wrath of God during this time. So when we study our Bible, we're introduced, first of all, number one in your outline, we're introduced to the three woes, the three woes that we will study to begin with. Now, are you listening? Pay close attention to me. The three woes, before we look at the definition of them, they cover a significant amount of Scripture. When you study your Bible and you begin to put it all together, these three woes begin in chapter 9. And for the next 106 verses in your Bible, or the next six chapters, that is the, the, the it encompasses 106 verses from chapter 9, verse number 1, all the way through to the next six chapters. Tell, it tells all that's going to happen during that time. Now, I will only be able to give a snapshot of all the things that are going to happen through these three woes. But I believe that God has given me insight to be able to give you enough of a snapshot that you will understand the severity of the woes of judgment that's going to fall upon this earth. So let's look, first of all, at the first woe, the first woe. And let's study, that is the sounding of the fifth trumpet as the angel takes the trumpet and he begins to blow and it tells us about that in John chapter 9, verse number 1 through 12. And the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Underline that in your Bible. There is a bottomless pit that the Bible says that this is unlocked during this first woe, the bottomless pit. If you study your Bible, you will be reminded that there is a place that is reserved for awful, evil demons. And these awful, evil demons are locked in the bottomless pit. Now, your Bible tells you that when Jesus was on this earth, that he met a man of the Gadarenes, and he was filled up with demons. And Jesus addressed this man, what is your name? And the demons begin to glee out, our name is Legion, for we are many. And Jesus, they said, whatever you do, don't send us to this awful place. And Jesus then rebuked them and cast out the demons out of the man. And they ran into a herd of swine and ran over the cliff and drowned in the below waters there below them. Can you imagine this, that demons that were on the earth when Jesus was here understood that there is a place that even demons do not want to go to, and that is the place of the bottomless pit. Because the demons that were loosed on the earth and the demons that are loose today know that there is a place that has been reserved for the worst awful incredible demons that are yet to come and they're locked in the bottomless pit. Now you may say, well, Brother Jackie, what does that mean? Well, when Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he told the story that the rich man died and went to hell. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. And the Bible tells us that Lazarus died and went to the bosom of Abraham. But Jesus also said that there was a great guff that separated the two so that no one could pass from one place to the other. And there in the bottom of that guff is a pit that is reserved reserved from the foundation of creation, and there in that pit there is a door that locks awful evil demons. And the Bible says right there that during this time of the first woe, that that bottomless pit will be opened, and those demons that have been reserved for this time of God's wrath and judgment will come out of that bottomless pit. And verse number two says, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth and to them was given power as of scum.
scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. Do you understand that locusts, when they swarm, that's what they do. They destroy every green plant. And Jesus now, the Word of God, is telling us that these demons look like locusts. And when they come out, they're required, do not touch the grass or the trees. But I want you to notice what they do have permission to do. And it says in this Word of God that they were given permission that they should not touch any green thing, neither any tree but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Are you listening to me? Say amen. Who are these men that have the mark in their foreheads? Well, it's the 144,000 evangelists that God has sealed with a mark that declares those people belong to me. So those 144,000 that are on this earth to be evangelists to people at that time pertaining to the kingdom of God, the Bible says that these demons cannot hurt those 144,000. But notice in verse number 5, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should what? Tormented them for how long, church? Five months. How long is five months in this scripture? It is a period of five months. They're to torment people for five months, and their torment, torment was the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days, men, are you listening? Men shall seek death, and they shall not find it, and they will desire to die, and death will flee from them. God's word is saying that in that awful five months where these demons are attacking and tormenting people that are on this earth that people will literally cry out I want to die I've got to get out of this place and God says that for five months you will not be able to die for those people that are left on this earth the word of God goes on and says in verse number 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like horses preparing to battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as teeth of lions, and they had breastplates and the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was given to hurt men, say it with me, five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in Greek it is Apollyon, and those two words mean destroyer. Woe, one woe is past, and behold, two woes more to come. Think about it for just a moment. As the inhabitants of this earth that have rejected the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture has taken. The church is gone to the third heaven to be with its glorious groom, the Lord Jesus. And there we are in glory land. Streets of gold, gates of pearl, the presence of the Lord. And we are in that place with the Lord. What a devastating moment it will be for those that are left behind. The bottomless pit is open and demons will come out of that bottomless pit. They are tormenting demons. Their assignment is not to kill people, but rather to torment them. The meaning of this scourge of scorpion locusts seems to be that a vast army of demons will be liberated from the bottomless pit who will enter into and take possession of the bodies of men and so torment them that they shall desire to die and shall not be able to die because the demons are preventing them. The old preacher Oliver Green who 
studied in such incredible intensity made this statement many years ago. He said, you may laugh at this, but you may wonder in this moment that there will be people like you, my brothers and sisters, that are in this auditorium that do not know Jesus as your Savior. Those of you that are watching online may laugh and sneer at this message of the fiery judgment of God. But old Oliver Green said that one morning you will be in your breakfast, in your dining room, having your breakfast, and as you sit at the breakfast table, you will look through the window into your backyard, and you will not be able to believe your own eyes, for you will wonder if you're losing your mind. For in your backyard you will see what resembles a group of midget horses. They will have unique bodies. They will be wearing crowns that look like gold. They will have an unusual tail. And as you gaze out the window, one of them will raise its demonic head and look you cold in the eyes. The blood in your veins will run cold like never before as you sit all struck and dumbfounded, amazed, and you will see demons from hell looking at you face to face. When this demon locust lifts its head, you will see that he has the face of a man and hair like a woman. When he opens his mouth, you will understand that his teeth are sharp as the teeth of lions. And you will notice the breast of this demon locust is protected by something that resembles iron. I know that this is a horrible picture, but you will want to run for your life. You may faint hard. You may drop in your tracks. But nonetheless, my friend, I know this is a horrible picture, but I must preach the totality of the Word of God without compromise and without apology. Ladies and gentlemen, this day is surely coming upon this earth. Now you won't hear preaching like that from many pulpits in the day that we live in today. Let me assure you of this. I believe what I'm suggesting here will literally happen right here on this earth. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to Brother Jack. You get this picture in your mind if you possibly can. Looking at that moment when all the church has gone into heaven and you're left behind upon this earth with the terrible wrath of God that will fall upon this earth. And if you could picture this in your mind, the incredible severity of this picture that is laid out in the book of Revelation. I beg of you today to fall upon your knees and call upon Jesus. Jesus, for he and he alone is the only hope in your life. Amen. The first woe is past, and now the second woe begins to blow. You'll understand that the second woe, the trumpet sounds, it's the sick trumpet. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 21, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which is four demons, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates that is around the current area of Babylon as we know it today. The Word of God says that in this time, that these demons will be released from that great river Euphrates and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour a day and a month and a year to slay one third of the part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand and I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that set upon them having breastplates of fire and jessineth and brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of little of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone stone which it was issued out of their mouth. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were likened to serpents and had heads. With them they do hurt. And the rest of the men 
which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murderers or their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Think about it for just a moment. Four demons are unleashed, and there is a 200 million man army that is gathered together to do battle in this time against the nation of Israel. And the Bible says as this 200 million man army is gathered together the word of God says one third of all the people on the earth will die at that time. Remember as we've studied before one third has already died and now the prophecy says another one third of people shall die in this time. The second woe was passed and then the third woe is sounded as we look there in the Word of God. The seventh trumpet sounds in chapter 11, verse number 14 through 15. The second woe is passed, and behold, the third woe comes what, church? Quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. What is it saying? The, the Lord Jesus is going to set up his kingdom upon this earth. And as we look at this in picture, we have to understand that we've studied the three woes of devastation and the judgment of God. But let, let me remind you that between trumpet number two and trumpet number three, there is an interlude between the two trumpets. In other words, God does something that interrupts this moment, and he gives an interlude between trumpet number two and trumpet number three. What does God do between this severity of this wrath and judgment that is going to fall upon this earth? We understand point number two, that God establishes two witnesses. These two witnesses are going to be established of the Lord during this time. And these two witnesses are talked about in the book of Revelation. Now we understand that there is 144 evangelists, but God in his sovereignty establishes during this time such a miraculous move for people on this earth that he appoints two witnesses to his kingdom. And I want you to notice in verse number three and verse number four, and I will give power to my what? Two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees of the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now when we think about that, these two witnesses, we understand that God has established that during this time he's going to establish two witnesses that are going to preach the message of the wrath of God and the judgment of God that is going to come. In other words, they're dressed in sackcloth, which is a dressing of grief and death and sorrow. And we look here at these two witnesses, and God has given them power to prophesy during this time. So let's think about these two witnesses that are in the interlude between trumpet number two three, or woe number two and woe number three. The first thing about them is their personalities, the personalities of these two witnesses. Many people have asked this question, who are these two witnesses? And many Bible scholars and theologians over the course of history have had differing opinions of who they are. This could be Moses who represents the law or Elijah who represents the prophets. Some theologians believe that it is Moses and Elijah because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets and a lot of theologians believe it is those two. And then there are other people that believe it is Elijah and Enoch. Those are the two that never died. That is that God took them off planet earth. They never died. Both of them never died. God saw fit to take them without dying. Me, myself, personally, I believe that it is Elijah and Enoch. I believe that is those two. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. 
Elijah and Enoch have never died. And I believe that God is going to bring them back. And they're going to be the two witnesses that are going to witness there during that time. Elijah and Enoch. Now as we think about that for years, people have had differing opinions. But God saw fit not to give us who they were. But I believe it is Elijah and Enoch based off that biblical truth. As we compare scripture to scripture. So we know their personalities that we look at. But look at their power. The power that they will have in their life as they are distinguished as the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. The Bible says in verse number 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. Think about that for just a moment, the incredible power that God gives them. It says that they are the olive tree, which represents the oil of God, and the lampstand that represents the light of God. They will have power to destroy their enemies. Fire will come come out of their mouth. They will have the power to stop heaven from rain to fall. They will turn the water into blood. They will call pestilence and plagues upon this earth. Think about it for just a minute. These men that are called the two witnesses will arrive on planet earth and they will preach a message that the world does not want to hear. God will give them a supernatural power and they will prophesy during this time. And enemies will try to destroy them. Ladies and gentlemen, are you with me? Listen to me closely. We're living in a world today that the world that we live in does not want to hear about sin. The world does not want to hear about judgment. The world does not want to hear about the wrath of God. This is not a popular sermon to preach in the world that we live in today. Ladies and gentlemen, during that time, these two prophets of God will be able to preach the Word of God. They'll call it what it is. You are sinners. You are doomed and destined for an eternity in hell. The wrath of God is going to fall upon this land. You will be destroyed by the judgment and the wrath of God. And the power of God will be upon them so that if somebody wants to destroy them, they'll speak and fire will come out of their mouth. They will be the people that will be protected of the Lord to prophesy these words in this time. So let's look thirdly at the prophecy. What are they going to do during this time? Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 3 says, And God, and I will give power to these my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. You look at that scripture, how defined God is, how specific He is. He says they're going to prophesy 1,260 days. What is 1,260 days? 1,260 days is 42 months. What is 42 months? Three and a half years. They're going to preach and prophesy for three and a half years. They're going to proclaim the witness of God. These two witnesses are true prophets speaking by divine revelation. The prophecy of the witness is given both to the Jew and to the Gentile. According to Revelation, they will preach hard their message of judgment. Are you listening to me? Every single day, every single day, they will preach judgment and hard sermons during that time. They'll preach that God is a God of judging. God is a God of wrath. In biblical times, God often used two witnesses to validate a truth. Theirs is a call to repentance and to be saved from judgment. So we know their prophecy is for three and a half years. But notice the persecution that they will endure during this time. Revelation 11, verse number 7 through verse number 10. The Bible says, and when they shall have what? Come on, help me. When they shall have what? Finished. How many of you understand when God starts something, he finishes? 
Now watch this. They did not get touched for three and a half years until they had finished the assignment God gave them. God had his hand on them for three and a half years. They're preaching. They're proclaiming judgment to come. They're saying God's anger and wrath is going to be revealed on this earth. And for three and a half years, that proclamation is made. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city. What is that great city? It is the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says their bodies are going to lie in that street, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues, and the Bible says that all nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another. Why? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half days, he goes on and talks about this incredible time. But let's stop right there. Here we find these two witnesses, and they're preaching, they're preaching, and they're preaching. And guess what? When you preach hard messages especially in the world we live in today. People can't stand it. Can, are you listening to me? I believe there's coming a time very soon that in the near weeks, months, and years ahead that for a man of God to come to this pulpit and preach the Word of God unashamedly and, and un uncompromisingly, the world is going to hate that message. Well, can you imagine what it will be like after the rapture takes place? Can you imagine when somebody stands up and preaches against sin and the Bible says the world is going to hate them and they're going to kill them? Think about it for just a moment. Their preaching will be fiery sermons of sin and judgment to come. Such preaching brings out the wicked hostility of men. So these people will be convinced that shooting the messenger will get rid of the message. You've heard it said, don't shoot the messenger, that's all I am. But they will con be convinced if we can shut them up, then we will avoid the message. Some of you today, you're like that. You're thinking, man, I don't want to go to church because if I go to church, I'm going to hear this stuff. And there's people today that will say, shut the churches down because we don't want to hear that mess. But oh, my friend, there'll come a day when you will die to hear it. You'll want to hear it. These prophets will preach. The Antichrist will have them executed in Jerusalem. Can you imagine this? Worldwide coverage. They are in the streets of Jerusalem. They are going to lay the bodies of these two prophets of God. And for three and a half days, the whole world will see their dead bodies laying in the streets of Jerusalem. Worldwide celebration. People are going to be celebrating. They're finally dead. I can hear the liberal news at that moment saying, Jerusalem troublemakers have died. Let's all rejoice. They're out of our hair. And they're going to be persecuted to death after God's finished with their assignment. But how many of you realize this? The devil will never win. Can I get an amen? So let's look at their prevailing. Amen. Let's look at their prevailing. What happens to these things? Two witnesses that are laying dead in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 11, notice what he says there. He says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life of God, of life from God enters to them. Can you imagine that? They're laying in the streets of Jerusalem, every camera's on them. The whole world is seeing it. And after three and a half days, light comes back in them. 
And the Bible says in that verse that they stood on their feet. And great fear fell upon them. Can you imagine that for a minute? And they heard a great voice from heaven, the Bible says, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Can I get an amen? Think about it for a minute. They, they're dead in the streets of Jerusalem. Everybody's watching them. And then in a moment, three and a half days later, they get life in them. And those bodies that have been dead for three and a half days stand up. And all of a sudden, they're taken up in a cloud into heaven. And the Bible says when that happens, everybody gets afraid. And then, the same hour was a great earthquake. And, and, and the tenth of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The resurrection of the two prophets, two man rapture happens, an astonished crowd. I can imagine the liberal press at that time is saying, Oh my gosh, the troublemakers have been resurrected. The world is rejoicing, and all of a sudden now the world is fearful, fearful. Fear engulfs them. And God, between the two woes, gives an interlude, gives an interlude to say, I want to show you what's going to happen between the two. I'm going to have two witnesses that's going to proclaim the judgment and wrath of God. And then the final thing. We've talked about the three woes. We've talked about the two witnesses. But we still got one problem. One problem. One problem still remains the same. The one problem that, that just drives me nuts. What is the one problem? They repented not. They still wouldn't repent. And notice what it says in verse number chapter 9, verse number 20 and 21. It says these words. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet they repented not. Of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. During that time, people will be engaged in demon worship. Idolatry, they'll be worshiping stuff, gold and silver, murder. The word that's used is sorceries. It's where we get the word pharmakia, which is the word drug abuse. Drugs will be used like never before. People will be worshiping demons and devils, idolatry, fornication, sexual perversion like the world has never seen. It's free love, man. Anything goes. Fornication, theft. But yet they would not repent. I mean, when the wrath of God is falling and the witnesses are preaching they're telling people judgment's coming. They still wouldn't repent. Three woes, two witnesses, one problem. People won't come to Christ. Did you know that every time a sinner refuses to receive the Lord Jesus and be saved, that refusal causes a sinner's heart to get hardened. The same gospel that softens your heart is the same gospel that will harden it if you refuse it. Every time a sinner says no to the Holy Spirit, Every time, every time you say no to God, every time you say no to the Holy Spirit, your heart gets harder. 
And as God knocks on your heart's door, and he knocks and he says, I want you to come to me. And you say, not today. Every time you reject him, your heart gets harder. Before long, your heart gets calloused. And you don't hear the knock anymore. And before long, watch this. God finally leaves you alone. What would it be like for you if God just left you alone? You quit hearing his knock. Your heart has gotten so hard that now God is saying, okay, I won't bother you anymore. They repented not. They didn't repent. Same problem we're seeing today when a, when a preacher preaches and, and a preacher that's a real preacher preaches and says, will you come to Jesus? And he gives a gospel invitation and there's hundreds that are watching and listening and if you're here and you walk away, your heart gets harder. And next time it's harder and harder and harder until finally that knock on your heart, you can't hear it anymore. They repented not. The bottom line that I have today is incredible to me. Why not Jesus and why not now? The Bible says, boast not yourself about tomorrow because you don't know what will happen tomorrow. The Word of God says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next Sunday, not next month, but today. If you are not a believer and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I beg of you to come to Christ today. I beg of you to, wherever you are, wherever you are, whether you're in this building or whether you're watching online or whether you're driving down the road, I beg of you right now, stop what you're doing. Bow your head. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I repent of my sins and I want you to come into my heart, my life, wherever you are. You may be in your living room. Wherever you are, God's hand is not shortened that he can't reach you. If you will just trust him, Give him your life and say, Lord, I come to you today. I give you my life. I give you everything. Lord, I, I want to commit myself to you today. And I believe that there are people in this building today that need to do that. I believe there are people that are watching online. I feel so strongly about that. I believe there's people watching online that, that needs to come to Christ. Why not Jesus and why not do it right now? In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And I, I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. I don't call people publicly to embarrass them. But I call you publicly because every person that Jesus called in the Bible, he called them publicly. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about a public call that I believe does something to a person. When you have to swallow your pride, you have to humble yourself and you have to come and you, you humble yourself and you say, Lord, I'm gonna confess you today before these people. I know there's a lot of people here and you may, your heart's probably beating out of your chest and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's everybody gonna think? You know what, it don't matter what everybody thinks. What matters is what God thinks. And today you can make a life-changing decision that will change not only your life in the now, but change your life in the hereafter if you would trust Him. Even with all that happened in what we've just studied, people still repent and not wave their fists at God and cursed Him that we will study in the Bible. They curse Him. They wouldn't repent. In just a moment, I'm going to invite ministers to come to the front, and they're going to be here to help you make decisions. For those of you that need to ask Jesus in your heart for the first time, just come to one of them. For those of you that need to join the church, you go, I want to be a part of this church, 
come to one of them. They'll help you with that decision. Or maybe you just need to come to an altar and pray and get your life, your house in order and get where you need to be with God. But this is your time, your time to respond to what the Holy Spirit has been saying to you all this time. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me all over this building. And as we stand together, I'm going to ask our ministers to come and I'm going to ask you to come. So wherever you are and whoever you are, this is your moment. If you're watching online, we invite you to pick up that phone and call our prayer line that you'll see on the screen. Somebody will answer that call. And we encourage you to dial that number and call us. So right now as we sing, would you come as we sing together? This is your moment. Would you come to Jesus as we sing?